some Christians are content to sit by and wait for heaven. Others are lulled into the hyper-grace deception of no need to work out one's salvation with fear and trembling because they are fully rested in the Calvinist doctrine of once saved, always saved. Then there are those of us who understand that we are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Second Timothy says, in a great house, they are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Now in scripture, God uses different images to describe his relationship with his children. I'm talking about those of us who are born again in Christ Jesus. He uses the image of the shepherd and the sheep, the husband and the wife, a father and his children, the church, the body of Christ, his bride, just to name a few. But perhaps I believe that one of the great portraits of God and his people to be found in the entire Bible is the picture Jeremiah paints of a potter and the clay. Let me read it for you. I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 18 from verse 1 through 6. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now, in this text, the potter has a singular purpose, and uh, I want us to look, first of all, at the intention of the potter. He plans to take clay and produce profitable vessels. That's his plan, to take ordinary, unusable, worthless clay, but in his hands, he intends to turn it into a vessel that is profitable. That's his plan. That's his intention. As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, God says. And he goes on to say, in Jeremiah also, I know the plans I have for you, God says, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. So, the potter, he plans, he purposes, he intends to take worthless clay and turn it into profitable vessels. Now, Jesus, he saves a sinner by his grace. And then he begins the process of changing that vile sinner into a vessel that would be profitable for the kingdom of God a vessel that will be useful in God's work to bring glory and honor to the Father's name. But the problem, there's a problem, and the problem is that the clay does not always cooperate. You see, the potter intends to make the clay into a useful vessel, but the clay is not always malleable. 
the clay is not always yielding, not always useful, see, not always uh, cooperating. So the potter, he has to send the clay or put the clay through a process. Now, the potter's intention, remember, is to make it into a useful vessel. But in the potter's hand, the clay is not always cooperative. But let me see if I can help you a bit to understand something here this morning. My friend, it takes a long time to make a strong Christian. It takes a long time to make a strong preacher, to make a strong church worker. It takes a long time to make a strong believer. But what happens is that in the church, we take people off the potter's wheel far too soon. We put a, a novice in a place of spiritual authority and they have not suffered enough, they had uh, not had enough trials in their lives, enough the sickness and suffering, they have, had not, uh, have not had enough disappointments. And uh, when God cannot take you through everything you need to go through in order to be useful, most times you will be clever enough to get to a place where you don't belong. So, but it's not by cleverness. It is not by your ability. It is not by your academic excellence. It's all about, my friend, spending time on the potter's wheel. Now, it is always the intention of the potter to turn that clay into a profitable vessel, uh, we know. But with all of his good intentions. He is limited to work only with the ingredients that are at hand, the uh, ingredients that are available to him. Now we know what the potter's intentions are. Now let us take a look at the ingredients that he has to work with. Now uh, usually a potter has to work with materials that leave much, much to, uh, to be desired in trying to achieve his goal. And that is the goal of turning a vile vessel into a useful instrument. It is really, really surprising what the Lord gets done with who he has to do it with. It never stops to amaze me at what the Lord accomplishes at Faith Community Church with the raw material he has to work with. And I believe that one of his first obstacles is one which I call residency. And by that, I mean, uh, by that I'm referring to those people who think that because they have been around for a while, that they are now worth something. Now hang in there with me and we'll, 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 we'll expand on it a little later on. But our true status before God is really this. He takes worthless material. He forms it and shapes it into a vessel useful for his service. And that does not happen without going through a process. You've got to spend time on the potter's wheel. Now, listen to this. Clay, as it is found in the ground, I'm talking about its raw state. It is not immediately suitable for the potter's use, not in that state. So it is brought out and allowed to weather for weeks, and then after weeks of weathering, the dry material is then dumped into a trough and covered completely with seawater. Now, what happens is that the lumps are softened, and uh, as they are softened, they are stirred until all of those lumps have disintegrated. And when the slimy, uh, when the slimy, uh, muddy substance is formed, uh, it is referred to as slip. Yes, slip. Now, that slip is then drawn off 
and allowed to settle in a tank where all the stones and all the remaining lumps are removed. Now, when the clay has been given enough time to settle, the material is then worked by treading it underfoot. And after it has been treaded underfoot and allowed to sit for another six months, it is then ready to be used because the plasticity and uh, the pliability of the clay, uh, they have been given time to improve. It takes time for that to happen. So it takes a long time, you see, to get the clay out of the ground, to get all the lumps out of it, to settle it in a trough, cover it with seawater, make it into a substance called slip, tread it under your feet, take it out and let it settle for another six months in order to get everything ready before it is finally turned into a vessel that could be used. It takes a long, long process. And God is telling us, as the potter with the clay, so is he with his children. Now, I'll tell you something, you know. That vessel could not have become what it became without all uh, or without going through all that processing that it got before it eventually ended up on the potter's wheel. Brothers and sisters, before God can even get you on that wheel, he's got to get the lumps out. He's got to thread you under his feet. And, uh, you know, you've got to cry. You've got to suffer. You've got to sit a while. You've got to take some stuff that you thought you would have never been able to take. You've got to stand under some stuff that you never thought that you would have been able to stand up under. And then after that process, God he puts you on a wheel. And uh, uh, that takes you through yet another process. So we know of the potter's intentions. I've talked about the uh, potter's ingredients. Now, let me take a moment to deal with the potter's instruments. There's a shovel with which he digs the clay from out of the earth. Now, that clay is mixed with mud and it's only a skilled potter who knows the difference between mud and clay. Only an experienced potter knows how to differentiate between clay and mud. See? Because in the process of making the clay pliable, the potter, see, he knows that when the sun comes out, that is S-U-N, if it is mud, it will stiffen up. But if it is clay, it will soften up. See? So the S-U-N will soften one and stiffen the other. Now, Holy Spirit is the shovel. Is the shovel that the potter uses to dig up the clay. And uh, everybody here this morning is made up of one of the two substances. You are either mud or clay. So that when the Sun, the S O N, shines in this worship today, this worship service today. You know what? It will stiffen some and it will soften others. I am glad that when Holy Spirit speaks to me, I do not have to harden my heart. I know I've been wrong. I know I've sinned. I know. I know that I'm not worth anything in myself. So I have got to allow Holy Spirit to soften me. And hear what Jesus said. And when he, he is come, speaking about Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of 
judgment. And Isaiah, concerning his own conversion, he noted that when Holy Spirit comes into the life of a believer, he makes you cry. Young lady, listen to me. Be careful marrying a man who don't cry because if he does not know how to cry, he, he'll make you cry. No, no, no. You see, when you sin, Holy Ghost would soften you. Holy Ghost would make you remorseful. He'll make you to regret that sin. No, no, no. Sin is not something you, 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 you beat your chest and brag about. See, the initial flesh reaction is that you will try to cover it up. But the problem is that when you cover it up, you cannot prosper because God says you've got to confess your sin. God says you've got to deal with your sin. He says if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So you see, you have to confess your sin. You have to acknowledge it. You have to take ownership. You have to confess it and the Lord will have mercy on you. Hallelujah. So, when you come to worship and, uh, and, and you cry in God's presence, you know why you're crying? You know that you don't deserve to be here. You know that, that you don't deserve His love. You know that it is all because of His unconditional love that He saved you in the first place. Now, that's the problem that I have with Christians who support same-sex marriage. Those of us who know we are sinners, we are not trying to expose that. Something is wrong, my friend, when you want to bring sin out of the uh, closet and condone it and explain it away. In fact, uh, when I sin, I want to keep that covered up because Really, I am ashamed of it. I'm embarrassed by it. You see, because I call myself Christian. So when I sin, I am not trying to come out into the light. I am trying to go in the dark to get with God on a personal basis and confess my sin because I know He's got the shovel to shovel the mud from the clay. So you've got to go before God and confess because only Holy Ghost knows how to separate mud from clay. You can't trust anyone else to do that, you know. You can't go to your prayer circle. You can't trust your prayer circle to do that because truly they might uh, uh, get rid of the of the clay in trying to get rid of the mud. You know, now, you remember Jesus telling a parable about wheat and tears? He says, while men slept, the enemy came in and sowed some tears among the wheat. One of the workers came and said, Lord, do we go in there and bundle up the tears and get rid of them? Jesus said, no, no, leave it alone. You are not smart enough to do that. Leave it alone. You are not precise enough to do that. Leave it al alone. You are not discerning enough to do that. Let the wheat and the tears grow together. And when I come, when I come, I will do the separation. See, there's mud and there's clay amongst us right now. Because as I'm speaking this moment, people, there are some people who are getting stiff while others are softening up. And may I say this, you know who you are. So don't try to figure out, you know, who, who it is, who is mud and who is clay. See, now you, as I said a while ago, you cannot tell mud from clay. 
but you can surely tell if you are getting stiff or if you are softening up. It's only you can know that. Now, the next instrument that the potter uses is a mallet. After the clay has been cleansed and processed, it is then placed on a flat uh, surface, perhaps a table, and it, it is beaten to remove air bubbles because if the air bubbles are not removed, when the potter gets it on the wheel and fashions it into a vessel, there'll be some weak spots. See? So God will put you on the table to pound you, to hammer you, and that's when you cry. Yes, you realize you have to go to the doctor, you have to go through a surgery. As the children break your heart, people criticize you, and you get stabbed in the back. Life throws you a curved board. Listen, 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 my friend. God is just getting the air bubbles out so that when he gets ready to use you, there won't be any weak spots. Hallelujah. So your attitude ought to be, Lord, if you've got to beat me to bless me, if you've got to, if you've got to hurt me to heal me, if you've got to knock me down in order to pick me up, yes, Lord, uh, be it according to thy word, I am thine, O Lord. You know, having said this, don't be quick to ask God to use you, you know, because truth be told, you will have to go through some stuff. Because that's the mallet there. Thump, thump, thump. You know, you think that you're looking good today? The mallet, the mallet is working. You just got that promotion on the job? Thump, thump, thump. The mallet is working. You just landed a business contract? See? The mallet pounds. Thump, thump, thump. You just came through a period of fasting and praying? The mallet pounds. God is getting all the air bubbles out so that when you get full of yourself, when you get full of pride, when that door opens, when that opportunity comes around, you will not think that it is you who did it. Hear what Paul said. Therefore, would I rather glory in my limitations and in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. But the only way Paul could have occasioned that statement is when you go up a few verses where he said, I had a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. In other words, lest you get too high and your feet get too high off the ground. God, he will send some stuff. He would allow stuff to come your way to humble you so that he can use you. Now, if you have cried in the midnight hour, if you did the best that you could do and it didn't work out the way you thought, if you have prayed and asked God for an answer and it didn't come, but you are still hanging on, listen my friend, God will answer. He will show up. He will answer though at a time that is according to his plan and purpose and he would answer in a way that pleases him in order to make you a useful vessel. Now, you don't have to go far to understand what I'm saying here. If it uh, hadn't been for that divorce in your life, you would not know how really strong you are by yourself. If it had not been for that spell of sickness, you would not know what your faith could bring you through in your midnight hour, my friend. Yes, you're still crying, but you know what? You You've got joy. Your heart is still hurting, but you can still say, Hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. You don't know where you went wrong, but you can still praise the Lord because you know that when you keep trusting him, he will surely, surely hear your cry and answer your prayer. Hallelujah. So we are instruments. The potter not only uses a shovel and a mallet, he also has a wheel. It is like Ezekiel's wheel within a wheel. There's the larger wheel down below that he pedals on. Now you can hear it, but you cannot see it. So, so that bigger wheel that he is pedaling, um, it's down below. You, you can't see it, but you can hear it. And there's also that smaller wheel at the top that is spinning the clay. Now, get this. While the potter is spinning on that wheel, see where the clay is, I can find comfort in knowing that I am never out of the potter's hands. See, I am in his hands, not in someone else's hands, because if it was your hands, you'd never stop hitting me. You will never stop punishing me. That's why, you know, you cannot uh, uh, let uh, folks know that you're hurting or where you're hurting. Because if you let them know where you're hurting, they will keep on hitting in that same spot over and over and over again. So you can't let them know what get, you know, what gets on your nerves. You can never let them know, see, that they got you cross. No, 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 no. You see, they know you will be under their control because they could press those buttons whenever they want to. All right, thank God that I'm in his hands and uh, not in anyone, uh, anyone else's hands. That I'm in his hands and I'm not in yours because you'll never stop beating me. You'll never stop shoveling on me. You will never stop hammering on me. You will never stop stomping on me. See? So you can't let folks know when you mess up. Everybody cannot know your weak spots because they will use it to their advantage against you. Now, remember, God relates to us on the basis of covenant, covenant relationships. Because with covenant, you can feel safe in your covenant relationship, knowing that your honor will never be violated or betrayed by your covenant partner. That's why God is in covenant with us. And as his church, the body of Christ, we are in covenant with each other. But how many of us really walk in serious covenant relationship? So in the absence of that kind of serious covenant relationship, there are some sins, my friend, that you only confess to the Lord. Only God knows where your air bubbles are in your vessel. And only God knows how to get them out so that there are no weak spots in your testimony. Now, as long as the clay is on the wheel, it is in the potter's hand. But Jeremiah tells us in the text that this vessel, this piece of clay, got marred in the hand of the potter. So the vessel is misshapen in the potter's hand. The vessel is imperfect in the potter's hands. See, it's in the potter's hands, but there are still problems with it. Now, if you get messed up while you are in the potter's hands, could you imagine how messed up you will be outside of the potter's hands? But get this, even though 
I am not all I ought to be in the potter's hands, even though I am messed up. Thank God I am still in his hands, because when there is an imperfection, the Bible says he starts all over again, because the fault is not with the potter, the fault is with the clay. It's like you start off your Christian life real good, and everything is coming up rosy and nice for you. You're doing everything the Lord has called you to do. You're praying all the right prayers, bowing your head and praying over your lunch, even at the workplace, even in school. You are obeying God, going to church, reading your Bible. You are being good to your wife, nice to your children. But then, while you're in the potter's hands, trials come your way, temptations come your way. And uh, every turn of the wheel, you're still on the potter's wheel, but every turn of the wheel makes your blemish more and more visible. Because the wheel is still spinning. See, he is still using you in ministry. But there's nothing that you can hide from the potter. There's nothing that you can hide from God. The reality is this. When you mess up, you really, you, you, you're too embarrassed to come back and uh, get uh, to work again because you know what the people are saying about you. You know what they are saying behind your back. You know what is, is being rumored. You know what is festering. You know those judgmental spirits, see, and the hypocrisy. And, 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 and with those people and how they're always trying to find some blemish, some fault in you. But listen, my friend, you are in the potter's hands and he knows that you have got those blemishes. He knows there are imperfections with the vessel, but the text goes on to say that he doesn't throw the vessel out. He doesn't discard it. He starts all over again. Hallelujah. You see, the Bible is littered with the wreckage of lives that began well and ended poorly. In the New Testament, we read of Alexander the coppersmith. Uh, Paul said of him, he did me much evil. Then Demas, who had forsaken Paul, having loved this present world. And the Bible also says that Paul's uh, other companions, they all forsook him. Then on the other hand, there are those in Scripture who started off poorly, but they ended up well. We read of John Mark, who forsook Paul in the middle of the mission. He gave up and he went back home. But the Bible says when the going gets rough for Paul, he is in prison and all uh, have, de de uh, they have deserted him. He writes to his son Timothy, that's his spiritual son, tell John Mark to come and visit me in prison because he is profitable for my ministry. So you see, you can mess up at the beginning, but God can always give you another chance. There's somebody here this morning who has messed up more times than you can count, but God gave you another chance. You see, he's the God of another chance, not the God of a second chance, because you already messed up that second chance. Okay, now I want to just look at two blessings here that we find in the text. And the first blessing is what I call the perception of the potter. Because the potter's hands are on the vessel, he knows instantly whenever a problem arises. It is at that moment that he takes the necessary steps, see, to get that vessel back again to usable condition. And that's exactly what God does with us, my friend. When I get messed up in his hands, 
she takes the necessary steps instantly to get me back to usable condition. Now, sometimes those steps are painful. Sometimes they are embarrassing. Sometimes they hurt right down to the core. Sometimes uh, those steps, they break your heart. But God is not trying to hurt you. He is trying to bless you. He is not trying to wound you. He is not trying to intentionally embarrass you. Because the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, he chastens. Again, as I said before, our problem is that we put people in positions of authority who are not through on the potter's wheel. See, unless God gets those weak spots out of your testimony, you are absolutely of no use in his hand. So when you mess up, confess up. It is better, you see, to be discovered than to be found out because the Bible says, you'll be sure your sin will find you out. Now the second blessing is what I call the patience of the potter. The vessel is marred in his hands. He does not throw, uh, throw the clay away and start afresh. Now the reason he does not start with a, a fresh new piece of clay is because he has already had too much invested in salvaging the clay from the earth and preparing it for use to just throw it away. See, God does not throw you out because you messed up. He just starts all over again. That is God being patient with us. I thank God that he is patient, that he is long-suffering, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy, the Bible says. I am glad that God does not hold my past against me. Now, just in case you think I'm speaking over your head, all of us here right now, even though you haven't been to prison, you still have a record. Because if sins were to be exposed this morning, you would have to crawl out of this place just like the rest of us. So thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace because he does not throw us out. He just starts all over again. Now, let me tell you what will happen when you don't allow Holy Spirit to dig out those rough spots in your testimony. There comes a time when the potter is working with the clay and he is working with it and he has worked with it and he has worked with it. He has shaped it and twisted it and molded it and he has done everything he possibly can with it. But at some point, see, at some point, that clay will get hard. At that point, the potter, he doesn't throw it away, you know. He shelves it. In other words, he takes it out of use. So when we uh, apply the analogy here, uh, we do not lose our salvation. What happens is that you, you lose your usability. You lose your utility utilitarian value and get this God he will take another piece of clay and start working with it he will just put you on the shelf somebody listening to me you have been shelved by God because you got arrogant when he was using you see you thought that you were above everybody else when he was using you you thought that there will be no problem, no problems. You thought that no sin could catch up with you. And now that God has shelved you, you are hitting on people that God is using right now. So in closing, I um, want to mention that there are 
always two kinds of people that God uses. There are those vessels that are hard, they're sturdy, long-term. Vessels that he has used for many years, I'm talking about the old hard seeds, they are unbreakable. You lie on them, they are unbreakable. You get disgusted with them, they are unbreakable. You throw them against a wall, they are unbreakable. And they are unbreakable because God put something in them that the world cannot take out of them. So no matter what the weather is, no matter what their spiritual condition is, no matter how they are feeling physically, whenever you mention the name of Jesus, they get happy and they don't even care who is around them. You see, they watched God move mountains in their lives and they saw him do some unusual things for them. They are sturdy, sturdy vessels that God can use anytime. And then uh, the other kind, uh, they are what I call the delicate vessels. You know, they're beautiful to watch, but you can't get much use out of them. Because if you drop them, they're going to break. If you hurt their feelings, they will fall apart. If you say you don't like them, they're going to stop coming to church. If you don't let them lead the parade, they don't want to follow the drum beat. See, they don't want to follow the drum beat. They are soft, they are delicate, they can't take nothing. If you don't let them run something, they'll crack up because they are fine china. They are good to look at. You put them on the shelf, look at them, but you can't use them. Don't use them because the least little thing will break them. But thank God, thank God, they are vessels who have been through all kinds of weather sunshine and rain and storms, good times, bad times, sometimes up, sometimes down. And God has made them so strong that nothing, absolutely nothing can break their will. Nothing can break their testimony. Nothing can break their stride. Nothing can break their strut simply because they are made up of a different kind of material. Is there anyone here this morning who got mad in the hands of the potter? Is there anyone here with a checkered past, but God forgave you and he sanctified you, he cleaned you up and he gave you a brand new start and you are here today, you are here this morning testifying that although you fell down, God picked you up. Although you made a mistake, God did not hold that mistake against you. See, and you realize that you should be in hell, but God had mercy on you. So I thank God, personally, I thank God, and we all should, that we are clay in the hands of a loving Father. Clay in the hands of a loving Father. Hallelujah. So let us pray together. Father God, we give you thanks knowing who you are, a good God, a mighty God, a faithful God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for uh, dying on Calvary's cross and making a way back, back for us to the Father. So we are thankful, Holy Father, that we are clay in your hand. Not in anyone else's hands. We are clay in your hands. And if you harm on us, 
so be it, God, according to your word, because you know, and you know only how much we can bear. We thank you, mighty God, for grace and mercy that will follow us all the days of our lives. We thank you, God, for your loving kindness and your tender mercies and how you have entrusted so much in our hands. So, God, we can submit to your will, your divine purpose, and whatever the process is, Lord, you says, that the trials and tribulations in this life shall in no way be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. So thank you, God, for our overcomers this morning. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Holy Spirit, for empowering us to be overcomers. Hallelujah. Through the blood and through your word, through the word of our testimony, we declare it that. And if you listening to me right now, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is your opportune time. Just ask him, just say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. And he says he will give you peace that the world cannot give, a peace that passeth all understanding. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now, if you would stand for the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen and amen and amen. God richly bless you. See you next week.